Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're reading the entire Bible together out loud, chapter by chapter, looking at 2 Samuel chapter 2 today. This is this is a cool chapter. Battle lines are drawn. I mean, cool chapter in terms of it's exciting, right? Um, <clears throat> but, I mean, it's, uh, of course, disheartening that we see that after all the good that God did through Saul, unifying the tribes of Israel under one banner— there's already the division. You see the north-south division, which is really ominous already, foreshadowing what's going to happen later as the kingdom crumbles to pieces. But you see this is the fulfillment of Samuel's prophecy, that the kingdom is torn from Samuel, and in fact torn in two. Uh, Very, very key chapter here, setting the tone for the whole rest of the book and the action, what's going to happen here. Joining us today, we've got as our guest, Pastor Doug Nicely, pastor at Jerusalem Lutheran Church in Collinsville, Illinois, and of course I always say this, but for some reason it just seems like Pastor Nicely's church name always nicely goes well with our text. Good morning, <laughs> brother. How are you doing? Good morning, Pastor AJ. I'm doing just fine. Um, even though David doesn't end up in Jerusalem today, thank you much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, just, just. I mean, thinking about it in terms of like this kind of north-south Jerusalem, yeah. kind of um, anticipating anyway, and being in symbolic of of Judah, right? As, as Every, the kingdom. I mean, you you see already David as as king of Judah here, right? Every year when uh, we reach our uh, congregation's anniversary Sunday, I have them sing Jerusalem the Golden, and I keep reminding them that this isn't the same place. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, there is the well. I mean, and that's uh, of course what we talked a lot about in our in Revelation, like the different comparisons right. and how there is that kind of the, the heavenly and the physical and uh, right. both those things. And and, and yet, um, I think here too, you, you see a little bit of of that. I think that even mm-hmm. though he's not at Jerusalem, I mean, there there is in this sense this kind of spiritual Mount Zion. There is this sense in which. He is the the rightful king that God has chosen for his people, Mm -hmm. even if it doesn't necessarily quite look the way it should yet. No, and this is, uh, as I will say a little bit later, this is is not exactly what David had anticipated (laughs) was going to happen. Right. Yeah, I know. I, I, he must. He must be saying like, "Hey, can I get a refund on that anointing?" You know, this isn't. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't think I was gonna. You know, be just like uh, the king over half of this and have a contender and all this. But um. Right. But yeah, th- this is. I think what was in some ways already kind of uh, ominously set up when we saw the list of the names of Saul's sons who were who were killed with him. But we uh, we saw that not all of them died. Mm-hmm. No. And uh, that's going to be a continuing problem. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, brother, before we uh, turn to any more of the chapter, would you start us off with a word of prayer? Lord, thank you for your word. And we thank you for this, uh, the story of uh, King David. Not only is it important as uh, a part of the uh, genetic heritage of our Savior Jesus, but it also teaches us so many important lessons uh, from the life of David about what you say in your word and how that word needs to be applied to our lives. He is an outstanding biblical example of how we can keep and how we can face the, uh, the breaking of the commandments. We pray that we might learn lessons from him so that we don't have to make the same mistakes or that we can learn from his learning uh, when we deal with your word. We pray in Jesus the Savior's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, certainly, God has given us an amazing example in David, not um, mm-hmm. an example of a, a perfect man, but one who, despite his flaws, shows clear signs of sanctification, um, which, as Luther has said, uh, in some ways makes him a, a better example, <laughs> uh, yep. in that he's relatable. Uh, we saw in the last chapter, in chapter 1, how he reacts to the news of Saul's death, and he doesn't, you know, dance on uh, the grave of the man who um, had attacked him and who had done evil to him. He doesn't right. show disrespect. Um, he doesn't uh, take the opportunity to um, outscore political points uh, against his adversaries, but he shows all reverence and piety 
um, speaking of how he is a good example, uh, what else from the context ought, to we, ought we be thinking about, either from chapter 1 or from First Samuel, as we take a look at this chapter today? Uh, one time, a couple of years ago now, uh, I wrote my own Bible study based on the catechism. Um, and um, I learned years and years ago that uh, you can base an understanding of all the the first part of the Catechism, Ten Commandments, on the life and episodes in the life of King David. And um, mm. that, that episode in chapter 1 where he mourns the death of Saul is an outstanding yeah. example of how you can keep the fourth commandment. It's not just honoring your father and your mother, but it's also honoring those with authority. Amen. So that's that's my take on chapter one. Yeah, no, I I think so, and um, you know, we see how he he honors the Lord's uh, Messiah, how how he, how we, and I think we talked about this a little bit last week too, about how how we you know we don't have in the same way um, you know a, a God given monarch anointed by Samuel, right? But he does install leaders over us, and you know how should we? greet the news of, of their death or, um, you know, their, uh, any, any kind of malady or bad circumstance for them. Right. Um, and then, you know, just how we, how we react to that today, then, um, kind of in that vein, do you suppose that there's a, a different commandment that maybe David exemplifies how to keep? In chapter one, chapter two, then chapter two, well, chapter two, um, basically uh, talks not, not necessarily about any of the commandments, uh, at least not my understanding of it, but uh, how God keeps his promises and how God keeps his promises in ways, we've already hinted at this, that we wouldn't have expected. Uh, when David was anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the next king of Israel, he was a teenager. Now we, we, and we figure he's about 30 years old, and he has spent almost all of those intervening years running away from King Saul mm -hmm. uh, because King Saul was trying to kill him. Right. Um, and, and as we mentioned also earlier, this may not have been the scenario he expected when Samuel did this, but it was a different situation entirely. Samuel is dead. Uh, King Saul is dead. Jonathan is dead. His good friend um, so he, he really has no choice but to try and figure out where God is going to lead him, and, and that's how this chapter begins. Well, I, I think in that way you, you do see David's faithfulness, that he's, that he's going to follow God and he's going to serve as the shepherd of God's mm -hmm. people, regardless of how, how, how not ideal <laughs> the, cir the circumstances right. are. Um, let's go ahead then and give the chapter a read through here. We've got Second Samuel chapter 2 here in the English Standard mm -hmm. Version from the top. After this, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. David said, To which shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. So David went up there, and his two wives also, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel, and David brought up his men who were with him, every one with his household, and they lived in the towns of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. When they told David, it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul. David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, May you be blessed by the Lord because you showed this loyalty to Saul your Lord and buried him. Now may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you. And I will do good to you because you have done this good thing. Now, therefore, let your hands be strong and be valiant, for Saul, your Lord, is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. But Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim, and he made him king over Gilead and the Asherites and Jezreel and Ephraim and Benjamin and all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was forty years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David, and the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon, 
And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and the servants of David went out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, Let the young men arise and compete before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. Then they arose and passed over by number, twelve for Benjamin and Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. And each caught his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side, so they fell down together. Therefore that place was called Helkath Hazarim, which is at Gibeon. And the battle was very fierce that day. And Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David, and the three sons of Zeruiah were there, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Now Asahel was as swift of foot as a wild gazelle, and Asahel pursued Abner. And as he went, he turned neither to the right nor to the left from following Abner. Then Abner looked behind him and said, Is it you, Asahel? And he said, It is I. Abner said to him, Turn aside to your right hand or to your left and seize one of the young men and take his spoil. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. And Abner said again to Asahel, Turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I lift up my face to your brother Joab? But he refused to turn aside. Therefore Abner struck him in the stomach with the butt of his spear, so that the spear came out his back. And he fell there and died where he was. And all who came to the place where Asahel had fallen and died stood still. But Joab and Abishai pursued Abner. And as the sun was going down, they came to the hill of Amma, which lies before Gaia on the way to the wilderness of Gibeon. And the people of Benjamin gathered themselves together behind Abner and became one group and took their stand on top of a hill. Then Abner called to Joab, Shall the sword devour forever? Do you not know that the end will be bitter how long will it be before you tell your people to turn from the pursuit of their brothers? And Joab said, As God lives, if you had not spoken, surely the men would have not, would not have given up the pursuit of their brothers until the morning. So Joab blew, blew the trumpet, and all the men stopped and pursued Israel no more, nor did they fight any more. And Abner and his men went all that night through the, through the Arabah, they crossed the Jordan, and marching the whole morning, they came to Mahanaim. Joab returned from the pursuit of Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there were missing from David's servants nineteen men besides Asahel. But the servants of David had struck down a Benjamin, three hundred sixty of Abner's men, and they took up Asahel and buried him in the tomb of his father, which was at Bethlehem. And Joab and his men marched all night, and the, and the day broke upon them at Hebron. Thank you. All That's right. So, thing. all right. We yeah, have a lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah, we, we do, but kind of like taking a step back and, and looking at this chapter, um, you know, it's just, it's interesting how these characters who so far had been relatively minor characters, right, are the mm -hmm. ones who, who take center stage for a time here. It's not really about they do. David and Ishbosheth. Ish, I can't say the name right now. Ishbosheth. Ish um, yes personally right like they're they're not like personally right there you, you kind of it's all about their proxies about these messages that are getting sent back and forth about these people who are deciding who they're going to be loyal to and kind of in the midst of it there's like this like there's this competition in this this pursuit we have going on here which i think might be i don't know might, might strike us kind of kind of strange like hang on what what's going on here is this like a foot race <laughs> what you know like what's uh what's going on what's the How's this kind of fitting into the bigger picture? Uh, let me uh, let me give you a little background. Um, uh, I've uh, I've done a little bit of study in this area, and mm -hmm. um, uh, one of my what I call tour guides uh, is a is a fellow who wrote a book about this whole story of David, uh, Eugene Peterson. You probably remember him from the Message yeah. translation. Yep. Yep. Uh, well, his book is called Leap Over a Wall, and uh, and basically. Uh, the subtitle is interesting, Earthly Spirituality for Everyday Christians. Mm. And, and he talks about this, this, uh, this thing that you just, uh, you just said. And he calls uh, these guys uh, who, who went out in the midst of the wilderness to, to do this battle, uh, Abner and Joab and his brothers, he calls them boneheads. <laughs> and and just to make a comment on what you just said, it says yeah. why are the why are boneheads like Joab and Abner allowed to take up so much space? The answer is quite obvious. Even if uncongenial, this 
is the context and the company in which God chooses to work out our salvation. Abner and Job are also in this story, and the sooner we get used to it, the better. Interesting. Hmm. So it, it's not at this point all about David and Ishbosheth. Uh, it, it will be later. Well, uh, it, we'll get to that a little bit later too. But what's mm-hmm. kind of interesting is, is once again, some of the stuff that's below the surface here. Uh, if you remember, you've got a parallel account in First Chronicles to what's going on in Second Samuel. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, First Chronicles is is much more into genealogies and names of people and what have you. Right. And, and what's and what's interesting about the name Ishbosheth, for instance, is that that's not his real name. Sure. His real name is Ishbael. Right which means he was named after the Canaanite god. This is Saul's son, who named his son after the Canaanite god, Baal. Uh, uh, Ishbosheth would mean man of Baal. Um, uh, Ishbael would yeah. be man of Baal. Ishbosheth actually means literally uh, the man of shame. Right. And and you know and that that can make you feel bad about uh, bad about Saul, but but that's not the whole that's not the whole story. Jonathan had a son, if you remember, who was named Mephibosheth. Mm-hmm. And once again, if you compare Chronicles, his name really was Mephbaal, mm-hmm. which means that Jonathan named his son after the Canaanite god too. Interesting. Well, it yes. Shows that these people were dedicated to the Lord, but in the ancient world, um, there were there were gods f- for every nation. Now we're, we understand that, but part of it is an understanding of what the gods did and how they performed and what they produced. If you right. won a war, if you won a battle, then your god was stronger than the other people's gods. Right. And apparently, um, either Saul and Jonathan wanted to play it safe. <laughs> or um, for one reason or another, decided that they were going to uh, rely upon the Canaanite gods, um, maybe not exclusively, but you right. know, at least keeping them in the at least keeping them in the ballpark. And that's an interesting commentary on the kings and prince of of, uh, of Israel. Well, you know, and it is, I think, another um, helpful reminder. You know, lest we think that, like, oh, well, you know, Saul is just terrible evil guy and then like everybody you know everyone else in this story they're like you know nice like white knights and shining armor or something like that but like even jonathan right names his son with that you know as you were saying that that bail element in his name right um but point, pointing i think to a time like my, my take on that and I've, i mean i said it before when we've talked about these names is that you know bail on one level is a word that simply means lord or husband and so in a time where there's like a whole lot of things going on and um, not not a lot of centralization, um, it, mm-hmm. it's easy to, to kind of take that the idea of the name of God and say like, well, you know, God has many names. You know, there's El, there's Elohim, there's Yahweh, and there's you know Baal, you know, Lord, right? You know, there's right. there's Adonai, which also means Lord, right? And so right. it'd be very easy in that context to kind of just take it as uh, not just another one of God's names, but uh, in in later times, right? How when these things were kind of, I, th- I think, kind of the lines were getting more and more clearly drawn to be in a situation where you say, no, actually, you know, we're we're not going to use this term anymore for God because it's associated with all this 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 pagan stuff. And, and I think that maybe in some ways uh, does kind of complement this chapter where it's uh it, it's. I, I think on the one hand, like the battle lines are drawn, but it's mm-hmm. not as if everyone on David's side is just like, you know, just awesome and, and virtuous and never makes a mistake or something. Um, and then all the people on Saul's side are, are, are all just like terrible people. Uh, I, I think that this chapter is shows kind of like the names that the reality was much messier than that. Right. And, and, and talking a little bit about some of the other characters, um, it uh, it appears obvious uh, even in the reference in in this chapter uh, to uh, to Joab. Uh, we're told that Joab, Abishai, and Abner, uh, Joab and Abishai, and 
and and Asahel, the uh, the the other brother, um, came from Bethlehem, mm-hmm. and we tend to think that they were relatives of David, mm-hmm. which is how Joab became the uh, the superior general of David's army ultimately. Right. Well, yeah, no, and it's it's virtually impossible. Um, I think that that if if he's a fellow Bethlehemite, like well, we already know that Bethlehem's like a small town village, right? I right. mean, it, they, they would have been really well interconnected, and if they weren't related somehow, and they probably were. Um, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I mean, at the very least, they were just very close. They knew each other well, and and yeah. Uh, yeah so you so you kind of see, you know, David's right hand man and Saul's right hand man, right? Like kind of on on opposite sides here. Um, so I, I guess like kind of this speaks to one of the questions that we got over Facebook here, the way that they, that they talk to each other is really interesting. And so the question was, do do they have some kind of a rapport? Um, what what do you, what do you make of this, this banter that they have going back and forth? I, I get the impression that, um, you know, once again, all of this comes from from the uh, the reign and rule of King Saul, and, and okay. you'll remember that David was a part of that that group uh, of uh, Saul's supporters. He was, if you will, a, a cabinet minister. Well, he was more than that. He was an army commander. And I get the impression that that all of these that all of these uh, people, Abner and uh, Joab and the rest of them, uh, probably uh, did fight side by side in the army when they were fighting the wars that were led by King Saul, and that mm-hmm. they, they did know each other well. And, and it was interesting that Abner calls Joab uh, and, uh, and Esahel brother. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, they have a, like they have a, already have a connection. And uh, that's, that's an answer at the end of this chapter as to why Joab finally decided, oh, my goodness, you know. I would have really blown it if it weren't for uh, what you said. Sounds- well, y- yeah, and I, and I think we want to take a look at that and try to get un- understand this a little bit better with the connections here. So, uh, so you mentioned brother here, right? And so there's there's two mentions of of the word brother where this is in verse 22. Abner mm-hmm. said again to Asahel, so the second time, "Turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground?" How then could I lift up my face to your brother Joab, right? And I and I think that this is a uh, this is an idiom that seems to translate pretty well to English, right? It, I think mm-hmm. that we might say something like, you know, hi, how how could I do this? Um, how could I look, you know, say like, you know, look look this person in the eye, or like, right. you know, how how could I how could I look at this person with a straight face, or or you know, we, we kind of have expressions like that but idea being right so Asahel um and Joab being brothers if Abner goes and kills Asahel that's going to cause some kind of a rift between yeah. him and Joab so i mean i think that you're you're right that this comment this brother comment um would seem to indicate that yeah that there is a, a connection between Abner and Joab and even though they kind of find themselves as kind of uh, I don't know uh, analogs to each other on opposite sides of this of this line. Like right. they they don't want to personally wrong each other. Right. On the on the other side, when it comes to Abner, um, I think he's a lot more assertive when it comes to the establishing of Ishbosheth yeah. than uh, than Joab is with establishing David. Yes. You get the impression as you go through this that um, that if it weren't for Abner who came up with this idea about uh, Ishbosheth, that Ishbosheth probably wouldn't have even gotten it. Um, right. Abner, son of Ner, Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Manahem. And they made him king over Gilead and the Asherites and Jezreel and Naphtali and Benjamin and all of Israel. Abner made Ishbosheth the king. Right. Abner the general made Ishbosheth the king. Uh, and, this and, was and, this is interesting. I was going to say, I think, I think in a lot of ways that that makes sense that like the the mili- like this prominent military general would would play such a hand in it that he would either 
I don't know, t- in some ways take up the mantle himself, or at least be the, the kingmaker here um, in yeah. the absence of a prominent prophet like Samuel. Um, we, we should get back, I think, more to this uh, this dichotomy here, Joab and Abner, but it's time for our break. Everybody, hold on. We're looking okay. at Second Samuel chapter 2 on Thy Strong Word, and we'll be right back. <laughs> This has been quite a year, a lot of uncertainty, but there is one thing you can count on if you're a member of the Concordia Plans. Your benefits through the Concordia Plans are always with you to help keep you physically, emotionally, and financially healthy. Protect yourself and your family by signing up for your health care benefits, along with additional insurance and saving for retirement. Choose your 2021 benefits November 2nd through the 20th at concordiaplans.org slash my account. Since October of 1946, Holy Cross Lutheran Church, Reno, Illinois, has been hosting an annual worst mark featuring a whole hog meal. Held yearly for nearly three quarters of a century, our 2020 worst mark has been canceled due to the pandemic. Savoring the blessings of working together as a church family in an atmosphere of godly fellowship for the past 74 years, the Holy Cross Church family rejoices in the Lord with a whole hog attitude of gratitude. I'm Pastor Ken Bomberger. Join me weekday mornings at 7.15 for Oratio, your time of scripture, meditation, and music on KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Welcome back, everybody. Thy strong word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're looking at 2 Samuel chapter 2 today, joined by our guest, Pastor Doug Nicely, pastor at Jerusalem Lutheran Church in Collinsville, Illinois. If you've got a question for us and you're listening live, join the conversation, facebook.com slash A.J. Espinosa. Taking a look at a couple questions there that we'll turn to in a minute. You can send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. Uh, yeah, I got a few questions from James. We'll be taking a look at these here in just a moment. Good. You can also send uh, send your questions or comments along just by giving us a call, 1-800-730-2727, or if you're in St. Louis, 314-821-0850. I want to thank our underwriters at the Lutheran Heritage Foundation for their support. Thank you guys for supporting Thy Strong Word, their website, lhfmissions.org. Org. So uh, we were just talking about this, you know, this this Joab Abner um, dichotomy, this this back and forth here. So mm-hmm. I, I think you were, you were starting to speak to this earlier. Um, okay, what what is going on? So they they start to they decide to have a, a competition of some yes. kind, right? Um, right. For and we should ask, like, so what exactly is this? competition but so so they, they have this competition and then abner multiple times says hey stop chasing me yeah. um and, and and then what after this doesn't get realized um it, it ends up that asahel gets struck dead and like there's a kind of a decent amount of narration in fact this is this is there's some more narration in some ways of this than there was of saul's death back in first samuel chapter 31 um, That's right. So, and then, and then, and then you mentioned at the end, Joab seems to have. Well, he seems to say something along the lines of, uh, "I mean, it, it sounds it sounds repentant." In verse twenty-seven, as God lives, if you had not spoken, surely the men would not have given up the pursuit of their brothers until the morning. So, just okay. What what is this competition? Is it as uh, you mentioned with the Eugene Peterson title there? Is it is it a bonehead idea? Um, is that why Joab is is repenting? It seemingly in verse twenty seven. Like, can, can you help us make sense of this? Well, well, just borrowing Peterson's phrase one more time. 
Uh, it isn't bonehead the way we normally understand this. A bonehead is a person who is who is driven, driven to accomplish whatever it is that his goal and objective is. And we have two boneheads against each other. Joab is absolutely convinced that uh, that his man David should become the king of all of Israel. And in some ways, Abner doesn't disagree uh, with uh, with the boneheadedness. Uh, you know, he's he's just uh, the champion of uh, of Ishbosheth, but he is well aware. Depending on how you handle this thing, um, because David's been anointed by by Samuel. Uh, depending on how you handle this thing, it all could just blow up. So I think Abner is just trying to step back a little bit and say, hey, listen, you know, if we don't argue with one another, um, maybe that's what we need to do today. But he isn't looking that much further into the future, which is an interesting problem, especially when you're dealing with generals. So, okay, so go- going back then into into verse, where was it here? Uh, into verse like uh, 13 and 14. So, mm-hmm. you know, they're sitting down on opposite sides here, right? Here's like yeah. the standoff. And it seems like Abner is the, it says, you know, Abner said to Joab, let the young men arise and compete before us, right? So it seems right. like this is Abner's idea. Like this is Abner's suggestion yeah. here. So like, what's he trying to accomplish with having, uh, the term here is the, the young men compete. Like what would, what would be gained from this? I think, I think you were saying something like, um, like he's he's he knows he's sitting on a tense situation, so maybe this is a yeah. way of averting some of that. This is uh, you know th- this sounds like a this sounds like a repeat of the story of uh, David and Goliath. Okay, remember they were they were confronting the Philistines. The uh, Israel was, and uh, and it was it was Goliath who came up with the idea that we're going to have we're going to have a competition of champions. If uh, if I win, then then you guys are defeated. Mm-hmm. If you win, then we're defeated. Now Goliath was a very tall man and what have you, and had no indication in his mind that there was any way in the world he was going to lose. Especially when he saw this teenager uh, who was a shepherd, he thought, "This is it. We're going to win." And so this was basically a tournament of champions. Okay. The, the only problem is that didn't turn out the way Abner thought it was going to. Okay, right. So on, on the one hand, then, it, it can seem like, all right, maybe this is a way of, you know, preventing an all-out, full-blown civil war, right? right? right. Um, which, which, seems, which seems prudent, um, mm-hmm. seems even, even pious, we might say. Yeah. And so, okay, so they, they agree to this here, and it says you got 12 for Benjamin, Ishbosheth, and 12 for David. And the, the conclusion, I guess— is that it says, you know, it says here, each caught his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side, and they fell down together. So it seems like, well, I, I guess this kind of just ends in a massive and tragic draw so yeah. that when, when then you get to verse 17 here, and, and this is uh, and this is like maybe, I think maybe like a difficulty in the translation too, but like the, the translation, you know, and the battle was very fierce that day. You you might take that if you're reading along in English, and I think I feel like actually as I read it, I almost kind of read it this way, um, as kind of a summary statement on what had happened between the twelve champions on the one side and the twelve champions on the other. But in the Hebrew, the form is actually, and the battle became uh, fierce, or or there arose even a very fierce battle that day. So I, I think that- to your point, it seems like. Well, because that just ends in this catastrophic failure, it's just an all-out brawl then between both right. sides. And that makes sense for what's said in verses 30 and 31, that uh, Joab found that uh, he was missing 19 of his men besides Asahel, uh, but the uh, servants of David had struck down uh, 360 of Abner's men. So this this chaos ended up in, in a real battle. So instead of a way of uh, preventing excess bloodshed and, and just keeping it being you know this 12 on 12, and, and then maybe we can just pack our bags and, and go home, it ends mm-hmm. up just provoking both sides and having them be all the more antagonized. And, and I think that gets back to 
how you were describing kind of uh, Peterson's take on or, or, or use of the term bonehead that it really yeah. just by seeing e each side, seeing these 12 men all just die this way, right? These, these 12 men that they were rooting for and like hoping, yeah, okay, they're, they're going to win. Uh, by seeing this happen, they are just, uh, I mean, they're, they're put into this frenzy, this, this bloodlust here. And okay. I think that gets to Joab's comment later that both sides were at the point after seeing this happen, that, they weren't going to stop until everyone on the other side was in the ground. Yeah, Abner thought he was starting a football game. Yeah, and uh, and, and and Joab's people decided, no, this is a war. Yes, right, e exactly. So, okay, so so you have that happen. The whole thing uh, just blows up, and so th and then yeah. I think then you get the you know this comment here. Um, about, you know, verse 18 and, and 19 then about, like, who's really fast and they're all, you know, this whole pursuing to the left and to the right. And yeah. so this is this is interesting then because Abner then, uh, I mean, this is, this is interesting in verse 22, um, or rather in verse 21, his first thing is turn aside to the right or the left and seize one of the young men and take his spoil. It's like he's almost trying to say, I mean, I don't know. This I think I feel like again actually kind of speaks to something positive about Abner, right? Because it's like he's trying to give Asahel an out, right? Like he's saying, right. like, "Hey, right. it's not that you're, it's not that I would beat you. It's not that you're slow and you'll never catch me. It's just, hey, look, I mean, like, why, why don't you, you know, here's some good spoil here, right? Like, I mean, yeah, is, is that what he's doing? Is it kind of like a, a way of trying to like yeah, you know, take, so. talk this hot head down? He says, "Well, look at all these pills here, uh, and, and, yeah. and from all these, all these would ultimately will be uh, 360 men here. You know, why don't you take some of their stuff and go home right. and uh, um, take your family out for dinner?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So, so right. I mean, so you know, so I mean, and this is a, this is a very interesting thing too that you know, it, there's this. Uh, I mean, and this is big too in, in this culture, but even still in ours, right? The idea of saving face that right. you, like if, if you if you try to say that you're, oh, well, I was like really kind and, you know, I, I didn't provoke them and like, well, I, I mean, I was very respectful, right? But if you don't right. like give the person a way of saving face, like you, you, you really are just antagonizing here. And so Abner does credit, like the older and wiser man, right? Is, right. Uh, is, is yeah, trying to give him a way of saving face, right? Um, and, but and just that, no matter what he says, uh, Asahel's just dead set on this. And being older and wiser may may be another interesting way of looking at this too. Uh, that Abner was older and wiser, and uh, and and uh, the the and and uh, the sons of Zariah, um, especially Asahel here, were were younger guys, and younger guys just don't have that that wisdom of understanding what it's like to be able to go through years and years and years of, uh, of conflict. Um, right. so, you know, they're, they're more on top of the moment where Asahel, because of his years and years of uh, service would understand what it's like to be able to navigate through all sorts of difficulties and manage to survive when it's all said and done. So it's an interesting um, an interesting competition between those who have experience and those who don't have as much experience. Well, and, and then and, you see how that experience then plays out. It says there in, in verse, uh, in verse 25, uh, verses 24 and 25, like the, this pursuit's just going on like <laughs> all day and through the wilderness. Yeah. Um, and then it says here, the people of Benjamin gathered themselves together behind Abner and became one group and took their stand on top of a hill. So um, what do you make of this, this hilltop moment then that seems to conclude the the day's fierce fighting? Well, this, this sounds like, once again, a lot of those battles that are described uh, earlier on in 1 Samuel. Uh, where you're you're uh, on top of a hill, which means that you're fortifying what later would be called a city, which is one of the reasons why they built walls around cities, so that people who uh, contended against them uh, would have to would have some a uh, barrier to keep them from uh, uh, from overcoming them quite so quickly. But of course, uh, Abner's people didn't have the advantage of that. 
And one of the disadvantages with this particular strategy of defending um, is that those who are, are offending can come at you from several different angles. And if you don't have walls, uh, you have no way of, under, uh, of understanding what it is that you're dealing with in terms of the opposition from the other side. They could come at you from all sorts of different directions, and you won't know you know, if you're just taking, uh, if you're just opposing everybody to their face, or the, half of them are at your back, about ready to get you. So no, they that's put a good, that's a good in a point vulnerable when you're, when you're, situation. When you, yeah, when you're fight, when you're fighting against a, a larger force, right, and, and you lack walls, that that could be a difficulty because you can be surrounded. But on on the other hand, here where th this is interesting, the way it talks about it, it says all the men of Benjamin gathered themselves mm -hmm. together behind Abner and became one group. How in this situation where you potentially have a, a larger force now, now mm -hmm. that hill is looking pretty good <laughs> because then if, if they decide that they want to keep going up this hill, right, they're mm -hmm. going to have to deal with this downhill charge against them where they won't be able to see what, what's what's going on. They, they have uh, poor visibility compared to the people yeah. who are up there on top, and they they literally have the people on top, the momentum, <laughs> in their favor. Yes, they do. So, and, and once again, that's become, that, that, uh, that comes very clear because of Ab, uh, Abner's uh, experience in, in waging yep. battles. He put right. himself in a more strategic position. Yeah, no, and but, so this totally, this totally reminds me of, uh, just because just it, it wouldn't be right to, to not make a Star Wars allusion here. Two, like in the, <laughs> in the prequel trilogy in Episode 3, how... Obi-Wan says to Anakin, it's over, Anakin, I have the high ground, right? That, that, that this move by seizing the high ground is a way of basically just ending the fight and just saying, like, look, like, there's no point in playing this out. We all know how it's going to end. Um, and unfortunately, Joab gets the message <laughs> and says, yeah, okay, right, fine. Right. Right. Like, we, there, is, there is no point in us doing this. And, and it seems like he comes to his senses. So... Uh, so, so I think then that these these three moments, right, where Abner suggests, hey, let's have these champions do this fight, um, mm -hmm. where Abner says, hey, why keep chasing me? You know, turn it aside, right? And then, hey, look, I've got the high ground, right? There's like three moments here where Abner shows, um, yeah, wisdom and experience, but also, I mean, I mean, he doesn't seem like such a bad guy, right? I mean, it's, it's like he's no. the one who's trying to stop the bloodshed between brothers, right? I mean, it, it is like oh, a very messy portrait. And later on, David will be very sad when Abner dies. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, so David had some had some respect for him, even if he was the man who who set up uh, Ishbosheth uh, Ishbosheth as uh, as the new king to rival David. David still would have respect, and I think that's because of their uh, their combined military career. Right. David knew that uh, that Abner was a was a smart general. Well, a smart, a smart general, and then, I mean, uh, it's hard to say, like, uh, an altogether bad man seems like a, no. a good one in, in many ways. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, then, this, I think, kind of gets uh, raises a question in my mind. You know, what, what was David doing then in, I don't know, seemingly, like, assaulting Abner's loyalty— back earlier when um, he had gone down with, I think it was with Abishai, um, to take Saul's spear, right? This was back yeah. in First Samuel right. chapter right. 26, right? Um, yes. Where in verse 15, David says to Abner, aren't, aren't you a man who's like you in Israel? Um, and then in verse 16, hey, this thing that you've done is not good as the Lord lives. You deserve to die. So so what's, what's David doing back in chapter 26 of the previous book? Um, you know, saying all this against Abner, if Abner is, I mean, really like a good guy who deserves admiration. Well, remember, he has spent uh, the better part of 15 years being pursued by Saul. Right. And uh, so so he has a moment. Once again, it's interesting that he is, uh, uh, that he is uh, pushed into this particular situation by, of all people, Joab and his brothers. <laughs> it keeps yeah. going on. Um, but he, but he says, uh, now listen, you know, this is, this is important, uh, in keeping what we were talking about in, uh, second Samuel chapter one, this is the King and we have to have respect for him. But, but I think David was using sarcasm here because, um, because, Ab because his general, 
uh, was was there sleeping next to him and not defending him. Right. This is more. I think this is more political commentary of, about Abner. Uh, there, uh, there uh, on the mountain next to Saul. He said, "Hey, you know, you're you're his uh, you're his commander in chief. Uh, how in the world do you end up sleeping, not defending him? Why were you asleep uh, when when somebody could come right up to your master and kill him?" David was being very being very gracious once again, keeping with the fourth commandment. Right. Uh, but I, I could imagine, especially when you're dealing militarily with people, that uh, that rivalry keeps coming up all the time. It's kind of like the rivalry that you have, and I'm going back to the illusion again, in sports, where you have people who are uh, who are good players on one team as opposed to another. And at that particular point, uh, when David was standing next to Saul, he realized that his team was a different team than Saul's team. Well, and I think that gets back to your comment very early on about how this chapter is about God's will, that perhaps Mm -hmm. back in chapter 26, um, as you were saying, this has more to do with, like, the— it's more of a commentary on David's part of the the partisanship, right? And he's, like, more like saying, you know, hey, it's not that Abner is a a bad or a lazy— you know, general or like an unfaithful servant, right? Or like, you know, hey, you're you're the guy who must have put these uh, anti-David ideas in Saul's head. But but no. maybe the point is saying, hey, look, um, you're you're a, you're you know, of course, like a great general, as as loyal as they come, and yet even you failed your king. Does that maybe not suggest that you're on the wrong side here? Right. I mean, because like it actually it's very interesting in chapter 26, how we have this comment that God was the one who sent them all into this deep sleep. And here we have mm-hmm. in chapter two here, you know, in, in many ways, Abner acting prudently, graciously, even wisely. Right. But like it just doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter how good of a, a man Abner is. He's still on the wrong side at the end right. of the day. I, I mean, and I think that really is a strong statement about God's will, that it's just, at the end of the day, I mean, I think it highlights how we are just beggars. It doesn't matter if we're trying really hard and being really loyal and all these all these other things, right? Like, ultimately, what what matters is God's will. Using, uh, using a little phrase I heard in uh, the political realm a few months ago, it's all about getting people to play your game. Hmm. Yeah, I'll, and Abner was trying to get people to play his game. Remember, as I said in the beginning of the chapter, it's obvious that this whole thing about Ishbosheth is Abner's idea. Yeah, well, yeah, no, you do. So you do have that. So, so going going like way back to the beginning of the chapter here, it it does very much seem to to be that um, Abner is the instigator, right? The way that it introduces him to, um, where was that here? It says there, uh, after like the message between uh, David and the man of Jabesh Gilead, you then have, uh, yeah, but Abner, son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim and made him king. Um, so yeah, it's, it's he's, the, he's the one who does it, right? I, yeah. I do wonder yeah. though, if, uh, if, if, if it's almost like, I don't know. I mean, because, I mean, it is, again, interesting that if Abner really is, like, kind of the most prominent general, like, left standing on the northern mm-hmm. side, I mean, it wouldn't have been difficult, I feel like, in the ancient world to just say, well, then I'm the king. I mean, like, we're going to see, like, you know, in, like, in New Testament history, right? Like, you just see how this happens kind of all the time, how you've got, you know, like, armies, they, they just, uh, they're they're all too eager to declare their general uh, mm-hmm. you know, to be the new king or the new emperor, right? Yes. So he, he, he doesn't do that. And in some ways, it's like Ishbosheth is like the last heir standing in the house of Saul. So I, I wonder to what extent that, you know, yeah, it's true. It's like it was all at Abner's initiative. But if Abner is just saying like, you know, I'm just I'm just doing like what a loyal, loyal soldier should do. Like it's my duty to support the heir of the, of the rightful king. And so it's just kind of like, again, yet another moment of kind of Abner doing the, the best he knows, but yes. the, even the best he knows is still fundamentally flawed. 
Right, because it was the best he knows was opposing uh, the purposes of God's kingdom. Right. Now, God had a so, plan. No matter what these other people's plans were, God had a plan, and it was going to be fulfilled. So I think then this, uh, I mean, I, I think I think it's, it, it takes a lot to just kind of like unpack this, but this kind of brings us then to some of the questions then. Um, so here's one we got over email from James. So who is properly oh, loyal James. here? Wonderful. Yeah, yes. Hmm? Um, who is properly loyal here? The tribes who received gifts from David? Or the tribes who backed the house of uh, the known anointed fallen king of Israel, right? So getting getting back to how, you know, uh, David he he defeats, um, you know, the the enemies uh, of God, like by by going and um, rescuing the people that had been taken by the Amalekites, and he gives gifts, right, to the to mm -hmm. these elders in Judah, who then go and they make him, um, you know, they anoint him to be king. So the, right. the question is, hang on a second. It, doesn't that seem shady? Like, are the people in Judah just saying, hey, here's one of our own, and he gave us presents, so let's anoint him, versus, uh, you know, Abner here, who, as we were saying, seems to be doing the best he knows. Like, who, who's who's acting righteously here? Well, and, and you see, the point here is that neither of them are acting righteously. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're, they're, just, they're just following... Um, uh, they're, they're just getting people, uh, once again, to, to and this was a political quote about the presidential election. They're just mm. getting people to play their game mm. and they had different games that they were playing. One of the things I like about David is that he is so fully human. Yeah. His whole story. Uh, is, is he righteous? Yes. There are moments when he can be chapter one, second Samuel is a good example. Uh, but there are times when he is just so otherwise. Yeah. And, and oh, yeah. it's not just the story of David and Bathsheba. Uh, there's, right. there's more, there, there are more levels to this story than you can imagine. David yeah. was great and he was wonderful. Say, for instance, at the, uh, when, when, he, when he had the opportunity to slay Saul and decided not to. That was respect for the office of king. Right. On the other side, you can't really say that you know that David was uh, that David was flawless here in what he was doing, uh, and and right. as we pointed out, you can't really say that that was the case also for Abner. So it was just so, uh, you know one was trying to per, uh, persevere over the other. Right. Well, and I think that that uh, it really then I think is a challenging thing for us then to come away with then in making application. This is kind of another one of the questions via email about, yeah. you know, how this is pertaining to our own, like, you know, the, the election uh, cycle, as sure. you were mentioning, right? Because sure. I feel like, like this story with, with Abner and, and David um, and Joab, I think you got two sides who in many ways, there's, there's, there's good, virtuous people on both sides who are acting wisely, prudently, um, mm -hmm. and, and in some cases, honestly doing the best they know, right? Mm -hmm. um, but like you were saying, at the end of the day, no one's really acting righteously. Everyone's kind of playing the game, like you were saying, of just trying to get everyone else to go along with them. Yeah, and and ultimately the answer is, in the uh, um, if you want some direction, uh, take a look at the first reading from our worship yesterday that talked about Cyrus, king of Persia. Um, he he sent the children of Israel back. Uh, home again from Babylonian captivity. Interestingly enough, Isaiah said this 250 years before the event happened. But he, but he says that you did this despite the fact that you do not know me. Right. But God still accomplished his will through rulers. So, I mean, certainly a humbling uh, takeaway for, from this chapter yes. um, that it, it really just it really brings us to just confess our uh, how small we are before God, and to thank God right. for the ways that his will prevails, even despite the will of man. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you for unpacking a difficult chapter for us and helping us understand the story. All right. God bless you. L likewise, brother. Everybody, Pastor Doug Nicely, Jerusalem, Collins Hill, Illinois, going on to Chapter 3 next time. Till then, I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. Peace. Of the LCMS. Your support is vital for this program to continue. You can make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at kfuo.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Thy Strong Word.